animates our tradition. So we're going to see like our tradition is, is the liturgy, our actual life of the church, the life of the saints, and the, the witness of them. And then it guides the magisterium. So the Holy Spirit has plays a unique role in this in each three parts. And if you see, I've heard it explained like a, it's like a three stool, leg stool. So if you take away one leg, the stool falls over. So these three elements play an important role in passing down what God has revealed. So we're going to see how this works. So Matthew 28, the, the discourse, the, the final discourse of Christ, I mean, I mean, not discourse, the Great Commission. Christ says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, to, to Jesus. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all to observe all that I have spoken to you. See, I will always remain in you till the end of time. So Christ promised he will be with them. And he speaks of this teaching and authority. So we see Jesus is teaching and Jesus is authority. Jesus is teaching. The actual content is passed down through scripture and tradition. We can see this in 2 Thessalonians. When Paul writes to the Thessalonians saying, um, be firm and steadfast in what? In the tradition that you were sought either by oral statements or by letters of ours. So, so the actual writing, so the, the inspired, now obviously he wasn't speaking of the Gospels, but he saw that they were using these two means through oral teaching, which we call tradition, and by written text, which we call scripture. And also we see Jesus' authority. Um, this is one of the many, yeah, Matthew 10, Matthew 16, Matthew 18. I just like to use this one because it's not a very well quoted one. But um, this is actually right, right before Jesus does all these things. He, un, he cleans up, uh, he um, casts out these demons, he performs all these miracles. And then what does he do? He calls. And he called to him his 12 disciples, which we call the apostles, and gave them the authority. Same authority that he had to them to do all these things, to, um, to have authority over unclean spirits, cast them out, and to heal every disease. And then for that chapter, you see what the apostles are doing, what Jesus just did. So his authority was given to the church. And we see these three things. I'm just trying to root it in the actual text. Because I'm sure that you all have been questioned about this before. Uh, so what is scripture? When we speak of scripture, I don't, I'm going to just give a general overview. So we believe it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. There's 73 books, 46 Old Testament, 27 New. We've kind of gone over that. What is tradition? Because like we speak a tradition, and like some people say, oh, well, it's like the early church fathers. But, but people pick, pick sayings of the early church fathers and use it. So, so what does the church see as early tradition? So yes, it is the, some of the writings of the saints help explain that tradition. It's in the, the, prayer, the prayers of the liturgy and the, the practice of the universal church. So... That's kind of vague, so I want to give an example. Does anyone in here know when Martin Luther King Jr. was born? No, no, the date. Okay, maybe this wasn't a good example. Well, his birthday is January. January what? Yeah. Jan how, how do we know that? Are you a scholar? Of Martin? Yeah, 
Uh, how do we know? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh. So, okay, well, maybe this is a bad example. My bad. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but you all know what we do around that day? I guess me being a school teacher. <laughs> Yeah. So, so like we, as a society, honor his his birthday. So we know like it's somewhere well, like like kids don't have to go to school. We have this tradition that we do. No one need, no one needs to read it. Um, we just have this common understanding. So, the those. I'm just trying to take a secular example of of someone that we honor. Or, or when was the Declaration of Independence well, uh, was signed? But well, 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 what day? July 4th. How do you all know July? I mean, we all study. I mean, we have that tradition. In, so the church, we do this in our church. We celebrate days um, in our liturgical year. We build churches after um, events and um, and saints. So the the very the positive is lived out in the faithful, in the liturgy, in the prayers that are said. So um, I, I'm I think it was the Immaculate Conception, not the Assumption, but the Immaculate Conception was defined by the Church in 1856. I remember, four, 1854. Told you, not good for dates. <laughs> uh, but in the early church, they found, in archaeological digs, they found churches with that inscription um, etched in. Well, so, so that, that's, now, um, we don't find the phrase immaculate conception in the Bible or anything, but we can see they recognized it very from the very beginning, and there, and it was preserved in the tradition and how well how the church was. It celebrated that feast. Um, so uh, it, it's a little bit more than just like the writings of the saint. Um, yeah. So the magisterium. So we believe, we see that the magisterium is the pope. And the bishops in union with him, and this is the the teaching office of the church. So it's here to help guide us, and it guides us through creeds, form the ecumenical uh, councils. Um, they've so great. We've given us a catechism to that basically summarizes our faith. So we see the magisterium working helping us define things. So, so again, why would we need to know that? Because we're, we're all going to have different interpretations on what one text or one, one tradition is. And so you need a one single voice. I mean, we don't teach people math by saying, OK, we're going to learn algebra. Here's, here's the numbers. Here's the symbols. Go for it. <laughs> we, have a, we have a teacher that instructs them how to use the symbols, how to use the numbers, and what they mean. The same as with the Magisterium. Christ gave us a guide to show us, OK, what, what does the scriptures mean, and what, um, what does the tradition mean? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't read it personally. And we use the scriptures um, in the liturgy to help us um, seek God's own personal call for our life, our own vocation. But when it comes from the, the issues of what Christ taught, we need to seek what the, 
what the magisterium is saying. So it's a, um, we, need, we need to seek that in humility because it's very hard to, to uh, listen to someone else, but it's the way that Christ established it for us. So that, because there's, there's one truth, there's not many truths. So this was the, the deposit of faith, the diamond analogy. So uh, like I said, Christ, Christ gives us, uh, Christ gave the bishops that diamond. So think of that, that faith as it. So things are, are further explained and articulated when the church examines each aspect of the diamond. And so we're never going to fully understand the deposit of the faith we're always continually growing and understanding, but it's all still flowing from that one sacred deposit. So there's nothing new. It's just really examining the beauty of the diamond, which is Christ. So, I, I, like I said, I like, I like history, just don't like dates. That's kind of problematic, though. <laughs> um, so we see God acts in history so this is revelation God acting in history if it's in the Old Testament is it, if it's in Jesus Christ there's the revelation God reveals it's passed down by God animating and working through tradition eventually there. God inspires authors to write it down so we don't have the, the two means. And then it's God guides the church in preserving and in interpreting these things. And you can see it. I want to use the example of Christ. So Jesus fully reveals God. The apostles begin to preach. They didn't begin to write. They just began to preach. You read it in the Acts. They just went out and preached and preached and preached and preached. And then they realized, okay, when we read these people, we need to leave them with something. So God inspired them to write it down. So um, they wrote gospels. They wrote letters to help instruct churches. And then the church guided the church. They canonized and gave us the actual scriptures because if we didn't have the church, we wouldn't even know which letters were inspired. And it began to define the creeds. So we see, um, again, all three aspects are essential. So, um, again, um, the Holy Spirit inspires, animates, and guides. And we see this three, uh, three stool uh, seat. The scripture, tradition, and the magistrate. So I want to end with this picture, and then if you have any questions. So I absolutely love this picture. I was so grateful. Yeah, I gave gave all the PG-13 or PG version. Um, so I use this to teach kids also. Um, I had this picture in the back of my classroom, and I, I absolutely love it. So um, it's... This is on the top of the Sistine Chapel, and you have God and Adam, and you have God with all these angels. They look like they're holding him back, and he's doing everything that he can possibly do to touch Adam. I mean, look, look at the, like, the strain in, in God's face just trying to get to Adam, and then here's Adam. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and then, and you can, I mean, all Adam has to do to touch God is to lift his wrist, <laughs> to lift his finger. So, but, but I really think, um, in, in a serious note, a lot of times this depicts us, like, when we think about it, God, all we have to do is just accept what God has 
revealed to us. And, and a lot of times we make it difficult because of our own personal pride or, or our own little laziness. Oh, but the cowboys are playing and I really like cowboys and I don't really need to do this on Sunday. It's the cowboys. And nothing that the cow love the cowboys, love watching the cowboys. <laughs> nothing wrong with watching it. But we, we put things that we want before um, uh, fully submitting ourselves to God. Well, you know what? I really like the life that I'm living. It's nice and comfortable. I know I feel God calling me to do this, but or or God wants me to. He's having the church tell me that, that I should live my life like that, and that's too tough. I'm gonna just do it this way. Again, all we have to do is just change it. So um, I want. So we have God and humanity. Whoops. So God reveals himself. He reveals the truth, the way of salvation that's handed down to us in scripture, tradition, and the guidance of the magisterium. And we call this the the object of faith, the faith that we believe. But we're called to respond to this. So is this not, oh, well, that's some really nice ideas. Or, yeah, that's a neat idea about God. We have to respond to it. So we, it calls us to change our life, which may be uncomfortable. And we call this an act of faith. So it's our action. So a lot of times we get those words mixed up. Like, oh, he really knows his faith. Or, oh, they, they have a really great faith. We have the object of faith, the one that we know, that tells us how to live, how to um, who God is, and then we make that act of faith and living it out. And I, I uh, again call you all to that image. Are you, are you like Adam, just sitting there, or or do you just need to lift that finger up? So I'll end with that. We have like seven minutes. Do I have any questions? Or, Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, of those 39, what they call the Talmud? The Talmud? Yeah, you know, they have like the Torah is the first five. Torah. Yeah. No, you can't. I think I have an understanding. Uh, Talmud is part of a rabbinic tradition, essentially doing a commentary on scripture. Um, the Torah, the, write, the writings, uh, are the prophets. The Torah, um, the, the five books, the Pentateuch, um, then the prophets, and the history of the writings. And so those are the three ways they divide it. Um, but Talmud is specifically. Septuagint, which was created in 270, which was written a Greek translation of the Hebrew in 270 BC, uh, was and is continues to be the authoritative text until it's taken up in the Latin Vulgate. But still, scripture scholars today are going to look at that because it has the most refined language in terms of us being able to understand sacred revelation, the mens of a project as that really is. And those seven books primarily are contested by Luther and his cohorts because of fact that they were written in that most predominantly in that post uh, exilic tradition uh, in, that, in that period after basically Alexander the Great had conquered all of the world that they knew at that point um, there was suspicion about the context of, the, of, of it but if you read it it's awesome Jewish history and many Jewish people uh, read that with great excitement because it helps them to understand fully what was happening in that period because otherwise they had no frame of reference
Yes, sir. Yes, Father. Don't worry, it's nothing. Uh, could you maybe explain a little bit more about the, the theological statement, Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi? Uh, e. It's a very important statement to understand this chapter 2 particularly uh, yeah. in the lives of the faith. All right, so uh, the statement Lex Credendi, uh, again, I'm not good with Latin. It's, um, the law of prayer is uh, is a law of the church, that is it? A law of the faith. Or we pray what we believe. So the, the prayers at Mass or, t- or any of the prayers that we do um, reaffirms what we believe. So um, I'll give two examples of this. Um, uh, we're not just prayers, but uh, practices. So, um, so um, w- w- let's take the the example of like the the patent. We we bring back the the patent. Well, well, why do we bring up the bring out the patent for? Well, because we believe every particle of the Eucharist is. Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. So if we're going to believe that, then everything that we do is going to go around of what we believe. Um, we can also, when we start examining the, the prayers of the actual, in the liturgy, um, they articulate what we believe. So we just had the new translation of the mass why did we do that why why did we translate the 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 english um translation of the nervous order right why don't we just say well and also with you why do we say and with your spirit why does it even matter because what we're saying um articulates what we believe. So when we say, and with your spirit, Father, we're saying we, we acknowledge what has changed in the pre can do, is going to, when he was ordained, will, will change the body and blood. So even when we get into like the changing of the creed, all of those um, new words. It wasn't the way the churches didn't do it to make us uh, relearn the words. It was to help us better um, understand what we believe. Um, and a very. Do you want to add to that? Because the the example that that I'm gonna give you will probably end the conversation. No, what you said was great. Uh.